Over the next 30 days, Kimball, Ben, and I are going to build an off-grid setup for under $25,000. The entire setup, including the land, will cost less than the down payment of today's average American home. And by the end of the setup, you'll never have to pay for utilities again. In this series, we're going to show you how to begin with a starter shelter, like a canvas bell tent, then how to implement a rainwater catchment system for drinking water, a methane digester for green sanitation and cooking fuel, solar panels and a battery system for clean energy, raised beds for local food, and finally, a micro cabin for a more permanent shelter. These systems will meet your water, sanitation, energy, food, and shelter requirements. This is Off Grid in 30 Days. We had thought about building a cabin from the ground up with the studs and the plywood and the tin roofing, but for the sake of showing how plug and play these off-grid systems can be, we're buying a micro cabin from a portable shed company. These portable sheds range from five to $15,000. The micro shed that we're purchasing is 10 by 16 feet. It's gonna cost just over $6,000 and they deliver it to us on site. We want something that's very portable. We don't wanna pay a whole lot of money for a trailer to build a tiny house on wheels. We've done that before. We want something that can be pulled up by the truck to be moved where it needs to go. But before you get going in your cabin shell, the most accessible off-grid dwelling is typically a canvas tent. So we're going to clear the area up there, trim the branches back, mow the grass down so we've got a clean build site for our canvas tent. Then we're going to get cracking on the micro cabin. While Kimball utilizes the truck to get to the higher branches for cutting, Ben's gonna start mowing. Okay guys, so for the belt in, it needs to be a nice and level surface. So I'm using this electric mower that we actually charge using solar. And I'm gonna mow a small circle that the belt in can go on so it's nice and clean. And while Ben was clearing an area for the bell tent, Kimball was clearing an area for the micro cabin. When Ben was finished with the bell tent area, he then started working on paths, which are really great for structuring your off-grid site. Once Kimball was done making space for the micro cabin, he then made a designated burn pile away from the woods. Then he started to compost. We're not wasting anything. All the grass clippings are gonna be composted to start building that rich soil for all of our raised beds from Epic Gardening. All right, so we've done with the mowing and we're wrapped up with all the trimming. One cool side note, the mowers and the power tools we're using can all be charged by our solar rig. So we're literally using sunlight to do all this cutting. Now that we've got the site cleared for where the canvas tent's gonna go and the micro cabin, we are gonna go grab the canvas tent from our friends Life in Tents. We're super stoked to set up this tent before. We've never set one of theirs up and that's gonna be our initial shelter here at the off-grid site. We've never put this model of bell tent together before, but once we started, it only took us about two hours to finish it. It was really straightforward and really fun. Bring your own hammer, broom, cleaning rack. Bundled guy line ropes to avoid... And just like that, the bell tent is now put together. All that's left for today is to go pick out a cabin shell and order it. It's gonna take about seven to 10 days to get the shed delivered. So we're gonna go order that now just so we can save on time. We're currently on our way to go pick out a cabin shell. We've already kind of looked at it before and it seemed like a really good fit. But today we're just gonna be verifying that. The portable shed place we're going to has cabins and portable structures created by Mennonites down in Montezuma, Georgia. Mennonites in so far that I understand are like slightly high-tech Amish. What is the location called? Montezuma, Georgia. It's where all the Aztec gods came from. Oh. I'm kidding. <laughs> oh, no. I bought that. I was like, oh, cool. <laughs> I feel kind of like an idiot. This one's actually way bigger than we need. This one looks like someone started finishing it out, but it was probably a repo. See, they did the spray foam, and they started like putting um, drywall up. But, I mean, it's an awesome structure for a small house. There's a lot of bigger sheds here that would work great for a bigger project. Our micro cabin is specifically built to be tiny in every respect, to be more energy efficient. And you could make any one of these an off-grid dwelling. We're gonna go check out one that looks like it could be a good potential fit and at least get some photos of the wiring. Um, but it looks like the other location will probably have a better fit for us. This site's got a shell design we really like for the micro cabin. So let's go check it out. So we're currently waiting on the owner to get back. She's the one that's gonna be able to tell us more about the specs and whatnot. It's pretty warm out. 
uh, by the way, Ben, we actually found your home. Uh, Kim and I will be staying in this. We're thinking something like this is going to be perfect for you. Ben's bird home? Yeah, it's so funny. <laughs> Lame. <laughs> one of the things we like about this shell design is we just need one gutter for rainwater harvesting. So that tin roof allows us to harvest rainwater. You don't harvest rainwater from an asphalt roof. So one gutter, and then the IBC tanks all go back here with their covers. They stay in the shade. If they're in sunlight, they'll grow more algae. So we want the IBC tanks for water shaded. They're back here. The methane digester will be somewhere within, you know, 10 feet of, 10, 20 feet of the off-grid cabin. Joe? Don't break it. Welcome to the Taj. Ooh, it's nice and warm. So one of the reasons I like this shed as opposed to other shed shells, these are 16 inch on center studs. Other sheds were doing 22 inches, which isn't gonna provide as much structural support. This is closer to what you get on an actual house build. You hear that, Ben? 16, not 22. Okay. He's mocking me. No, I'm not, no. <laughs> he was. The owner arrived just a few minutes later, and we were able to complete our purchase. We then headed back home, but first stopped to get some coffee. Because Ben's nice and healthy, he got mango juice. Kimball got a nice little cup of coffee with a giant refill. <laughs> Whoa. And I got a Yoohoo. And also a mango drink to try to be healthy like Ben. It was kind of gross. Ooh. Okay, so Kimball just got back with all the supplies for the tent. I'm gonna carry all that up here, unbox everything, and then set it up in the tent. It's gonna look really cozy. I'm sure there's a way to tie those down. They seem all right. Never mind. Okay, I have no idea how all this stuff got in here, but I'm gonna do a quick sweep because there's a bunch of little debris that I should probably get out before I put down the main carpet. So this is our Life in Tint Timberline tent. But this tent breathes super well. We've been super happy with it. You wanna put a rug on top of the vinyl to avoid puncturing any parts of the vinyl. It's very durable, but we wanna play it safe. Okay, so next we have a blow up queen size mattress, which is awesome. We're gonna use the Delta EcoFlow to blow it up. I'm gonna plug it in, it's gonna blow up. Okay, so on this side, we're gonna make like the kitchen area of the tent. So I'm gonna start bringing in different things that would make sense to go over at the kitchen. Okay, so first for the kitchen is the GoSun cooler. This has a built-in battery, so it's gonna keep your things nice and cool for quite a while, especially if you have it plugged in directly to your solar panel or to the Delta EcoFlow. Okay, so now we have a cooktop burner. That's electric, so you can plug that into the Delta as well. We have a kettle, which can be used on top of that. And then we have a French press coffee maker. So yeah, you can definitely make tea or coffee. Okay, so we have two more miscellaneous crates. We'll unbox these shortly, but for now, we're just gonna set them to the side. Okay, so because this end is the kitchen part of the tent, I'm gonna unbox and put together the sink, which will go next to the cooler and next to the cooktop burner. We're gonna eventually get some sort of table or crate, and that's what the burner and stuff will go on, and you'll have this to wash up. Okay, so I'm just gonna put this together. Okay, so now I'm in the side of the tent, which is the living room. I got two wood chairs. I have this GoSun Breeze fan, which you can power off just 12 volts. So you can use a way smaller battery pack than the Delta. Right here, we have the living area. Super basic now, just have the basic chairs. But tomorrow, me, Joe, and Kimball are gonna make this look epic. Ben brought most of the things we need inside of the tent. We are waiting on the small wood stove to come in still. What we're really missing though are some tables and a few areas for storage. We'll go and see how affordably we can get those items for. Okay, so we just got back. We got a twin set of these pretty solid tables. We got a round small table and then some big plastic container boxes that we want to turn into the side tables for the bed. Okay, first we have the round table from Salvation Army. I'm thinking we're gonna add this in between the two chairs. Okay, now we have the twin set of these pretty sturdy wood tables. 
So we have the burner with the kettle, so you can make tea and coffee. And then we have coffee grounds right here. We have a plug-in electric heater. We have a few mugs. Underneath, we have the plates, tissue, some tea bags. On this side, we have things for the burner. We have the trash can. Monitor, check. And then we have the Xbox Series S, I believe. Let's say you made some sort of coffee or something and you need creamer. You have this pretty awesome Ghost Sun cooler. This can run, I think, about six to eight hours on its own, but we'll probably hook it up to the Delta so the Delta will keep it topped up. Okay, and this is the foot pump sink. All the dirty water that you wash off with your hands or whatever, like if you're washing vegetables or something, all of that water will drain out the back of the tent and into the woods. Okay, so the wood stove is gonna be coming in for about a week. So it is getting kind of chilly here in Georgia. So this is actually a heated blanket. So I'll use this to keep warm while we wait for the wood stove. It got really cold as the day has progressed. We really need the wood stove in here. Okay, this small little heater right here is using 1400 watts, which means the Delta EcoFlow at full power can power this for about half an hour, I think it's 32 minutes. So you can see that when it comes to using energy, heating and cooling takes the cake. We can only power this small heater for just 30 minutes from the one Delta EcoFlow. One solar panel outside is about 400 watts. We would need three to four of those solar panels with sunlight right now, just to cancel out how much is being drawn right now. That just kind of shows you roughly how much energy it takes to heat something. I'm gonna plug in the monitor and the Xbox power cord, and then that'll go underneath the bed to the Delta EcoFlow. Heating is important, but the real question is, how long can we power the Xbox and the monitor for? I'm gonna say we could power this for 10 hours. Nine. The Delta EcoFlow can run this Xbox and the monitor close to 10 hours. So the monitor and Xbox only take 67 watts, whereas the heater takes 1400. Next time you're in your home and you're about to plug in a space heater, just remember the amount of electricity it takes. That's insane. Okay, so the guys and I are getting a little hungry, so I'm going to use the apples. I'm gonna dice them up, sprinkle some cinnamon on them, and bake them in the Go Sun solar oven for about 30 minutes. Okay guys, so we just made the applesauce and they're gonna try it, so dig in. And nice. you might be wondering who this random guy is. Hi. This is That's my- That's all uh, you get. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know who he is either. No added sugar, just cinnamon. Sounds like a applesauce brand that organic soccer moms might like again. That was a joke Kimball made off camera, but he didn't make it on camera again, because it's pretty good. <laughs> it is really good. Today we got a lot of really cool things planned. Currently drinking some mushroom coffee stuff that Ben normally drinks. I thought I'd try it. And to be honest, in terms of how it compares to coffee, it's pretty bad. Today we're gonna to be implementing sanitation systems, which will be in the form of a methane digester and a composting toilet. And to even get these systems up and running, we're gonna to have to set up a few other things. For those that don't know, a methane digester essentially works like a cow stomach. There's a one-time input of water and cow manure. Together, we call this a slurry. All the anaerobic bacteria in the cow manure creates an anaerobic environment within the methane digester. So now we can input all of our food waste inside of the methane digester each day, and the bacteria will break it down into two byproducts. One is liquid fertilizer, which is great for for the garden, and the other is methane gas, which we use to cook with. Food waste naturally releases methane in a landfill, and methane gas is 25 times more potent than CO2. So by using the methane digester every day, you roughly cut down on six tons of CO2 emissions a year. Lastly, you can connect a flushable toilet to the methane digester, which now is acting like an above ground septic system. And you can see that a methane digester is a lot more affordable than the traditional septic system. Since the methane digester requires 1200 liters of water to function properly, we've got to get a hold of that water. You could do this with rainwater collection, a creek, a stream, a well. Because we already have access to this pond just 30 or 40 feet away, we're gonna pull water from the pond. We don't wanna haul it out manually with buckets. We'd like to use our water pumps. But to use our water pumps to haul all that water up, we need a place to store that water. We're gonna take our IBC totes, which hold 275 gallons of water within them to temporarily store pond water. But we need electricity before we can pump the water out. So we're gonna set up a 400 watt solar panel 
panel to connect to the Delta EcoFlow battery system. So we're gonna use solar energy to power the pumps to pull the water from the lake to the IBC totes, then fill up the methane digester, in addition to setting up the composting outhouse to get us off the ground. To understand the inputs and outputs of each system that we'll be implementing today and the cost, I'm going to be using our LandLab simulator, which our team developed this year. You can see that there are already a few systems in here. These are the ones that we added on day one, when we made our canvas belt tent and a few other systems. Now that Kimball's listed out all the systems we need for today, let's go ahead and start with the solar panel. We can see that the input is sunlight, which we have plenty of, the output is electricity, and the cost is about $550. So we'll go ahead and add that in. Next, we'll add in our two IBC totes. We can see that they range about $150 a piece. We'll add two of them in there. Next, we're going to be looking for a water pump, which I'll just slide down on the side column and select it there. Now I'll search for the methane digester. We can see all the inputs we'll be needing for it. And if we take a close look at the inputs, it's showing that we have all the water we need for the methane digester because the sim knows about the pond that I put on our site. So now that I know the inputs and outputs of each system, let's go ahead and order them. All I have to do is click on the system, then press on the link where the cost is. So if we access the system summary, we can now see the total of all the systems we have on site. And by viewing the human needs checklist, we see that we have plenty of water on site. The only issue is none of it's drinking water because we haven't implemented a purifier yet. So after adding in today's systems, we see with an overall off-grid score of 55. Now that everything's planned out, it's time to start on the solar panel. got our 400 watt solar panel behind me. Solar panels typically generate 12 to 24 volts of power. So you've got to take that power and then run it to a battery system, often 12 or 24 volt. Then that power goes to an inverter to become 120 volt power that we typically use with household appliances, like the pumps that we're about to connect. So I've got the connecting cables here to connect that 400 watt solar panel to our 1.3 kilowatt EcoFlow battery inverter combo pack. And that gives us a very simple but affordable way of converting electricity from sunlight right here for the off-grid build. Now we just need to connect our water pump to a hose, put one side of the water pump into the pond, connect it to power, and then connect the hose to our IBC totes, which will complete this entire setup. These IBC totes are all food grade. That's critical. Even though we're putting pond water in them, we want them to be free of any type of diesel fuel or formaldehyde or toxic chemicals. These used to contain corn syrup and then syrup for like ginger ale. So these are totally food grade, safe to use. We buy these from a supplier up in Atlanta. Um, you can likely find these in any like mid-sized to major city near you. Now that we have the solar and IBC totes set up and all the water we need filling up the IBC totes for the methane digester later, it's time to go ahead and get cracking on the composting toilet because it's going to take a while for these IBC totes to fill up. I've got the trusty clippers again. To make the composting toilet outhouse more secluded and private, we're going to cut a little path towards the magnolia tree that's farther into the woods. That keeps the composting toilet outhouse a little bit more off the beaten path just to promote more privacy. Sometimes the loppers are just a little too slow. I've been going full frugal recently. I made a bunch of beans and rice last night in the Instant Pot. We're heating things up in the ghost sun. You can see it's already steaming, so it's almost lunchtime. So Ben was just raking in here and he uncovered an old disc golf disc. I used to play back in the day. Let's see if I still have it. All right, this is for all the people that said I couldn't go pro. Well, after affirming the reason that I'm not a pro disc golfer, it was time to build the composting toilet. All right, let's explain all the elements of our composting toilet canvas outhouse. We've pieced all this together to make a really well-functioning outdoor bathroom with a canvas enclosure. We just made a simple deck out of decking boards and then two by fours. We set that on pavers, the tiny mobile foundation. We're using a nature's head compost toilet. That is the beating heart, the gem of the composting outhouse. Then we've got our five gallon bucket of peat moss. The peat moss is what you mix into the toilet for number twos to soak up excess moisture and then just to dry it out to where it starts turning into soil. The composting toilet diverts urine from solid waste. That's the magic of the composting toilet. When you mix those together, you get disgusting sewage. You keep them separate, you can use both elements to fertilize trees, bushes, and whatnot. Then we've got the canvas shell of the canvas outhouse. The canvas shell was $300. We ordered that online. Then we had to go purchase metal electrical conduit. That conduit 
is the frame for the outhouse. We did have to buy that separately. It was not included in the canvas outhouse. We've got a pedal powered sink that can contain a few gallons of water down below. You use your foot to push the pedal and it sends water up to the sink area where you can wash your hands. We've been super happy with it. We bought ours for about $90 online. I love how elegant it is and you don't need municipal water to supply it. We have the five gallon bucket of charcoal. That's where the air from the fan in the composting toilet is vented. That soaks up any small odors that might still remain. People can sometimes be a little leery of composting toilets. We wanna to show just how slick this setup can be. The composting toilet requires 12 volt power to run a small fan. The fan keeps solid waste dried out. That is part of the effectiveness of the composting toilet. Now that the composting toilet is finished, it's time to wrap up the methane digester. As we can see, the IVC toads are now full of water, meaning we can start the pumping process into the methane digester. One of the important parts to a methane digester are the sandbags on the top because they pressurize the methane to send it to the cooktop stove. Okay, so we need sand for the methane digester. Here's the problem. All the sand around this pond is actually just on one end of it and all of our neighbors have private property so we can't walk through it. So anyway, we're gonna send Ben to go get it. Okay guys, so I got my kayak, I got the little raft. I'm gonna tie the raft to the kayak. I have a shovel and then a bucket for the sand. I'm excited. Yep, you just tore a giant hole right there. Well, we have two. Will it work? While the SS Benjamin sails the high ponds looking for sand, we're gonna set up a small fire pit here to start burning down the brush pile, create a little bit of ash to add to the compost, and just build the campfire that we've been wanting out here. So while the methane digester is being filled up with water and Ben is getting sand, a lot of you might be wondering how we also got the cow manure for the methane digester. Kimball and I actually went out and asked a farmer if we could use his cow manure from his cows. And he said yes, even though he thought it was kind of weird. And I really can't blame him. So the methane digester is filling with water now. Even though it's cloudy outside, we're still getting about 60 watts of power coming out of the solar panel. Charging the battery, the battery's powering the pump, pump's moving the water. We've got brush burning down there while Ben's getting sand to pressurize the methane digester. All right, I'm gonna go check on Ben, see where he's at with the, uh, with the sand. Hey, dude. Wait, like, wait, what? Like, it's like this weird goopy sand. I'm afraid to step on it. Well, okay. So we ended up having to go get sand somewhere else, and then we started on the slurry. Delicious. How is that uh, working out for you? Pretty good. Shovel just fits in the bucket. It's like a giant Vitamix for crap. Joe is going to mix the last bucket of slurry. We saved you half a bucket of grade A cow poop. Nice. We're gonna need you to shovel this into that five gallon bucket. Then I'm gonna turn on the water pump so you can mix the slurry. You see my hands, Joe? Hey, don't forget, I was the one that went and picked this up with you, okay? That's true, he did. Cut to that footage. I've got my bucket here and I've got my shovel. I'm gonna go scoop some poop. Oh, I already got it on my finger. Ugh. Put that in a bucket. I feel like this is like off-grid hazing. <laughs> and then you can use your weapon of choice to stir it. You wanna know what freedom sounds like? Ben, what'd you think? Uh, it was pretty fun. Was it really? No, it was a little, little gross. Today, we'll be constructing a 200 square foot greenhouse that only cost us $250. The entire thing only took an hour and a half to set up. We'll be filling it up with our seedlings and showing you all our unique process for creating our own potting soil. And lastly, we'll be constructing raised beds and going over why you wanna set them up now during fall time instead of spring. We decided to start on the greenhouse first. The package came with the greenhouse sleeve and all the framing to hold it into place. We then save all the cardboard to help us start fires in the future. We first laid out all the framing into the rough greenhouse shape. We then connected each frame piece with bolts and tightened it up. With the foundation frame being done, we could then move on to the vertical posts, and then add in the supporting cross beams. It took about 45 minutes to add all the vertical posts in. Once this stage was completed, we could then start on the overhead support hoops. This stage definitely requires at least two people, as the first person needs to hold the hoop into place, and the second person needs to tighten everything up. 
Once all five support hoops are in place, you'll set up three support beams that span the length of the greenhouse. You can see that there's some pretty bad warping right now, but once we implement all three of these support beams, all the warping will go away. And lastly for the frame, we'll make sure everything's nice and tight. With the frame being completed, we can now move it to exactly where we want, which for us will be over our methane digester, which Kimball will explain. So the greenhouse gives us a lot of benefits for this off-grid build. The biggest benefit here in October is it allows us to operate the methane digester. Without the added heat increase, the methane digester likely would not activate. It could be pretty cool outdoors, but here in the greenhouse, we're consistently getting temps into the 60s, 70s, sometimes 80s, even in October. The greenhouse can easily raise the temperature by 10 degrees, sometimes as much as 20 degrees or more from the outside temp. Beyond that, the greenhouse gives us a great spot for starting seedlings of more cool weather plants that we're looking to replant into our grow bags or the raised beds. Beyond that, we could even take this greenhouse and if we wanted to, abut it next to the mini cabin. Greenhouses can act as a solarium to give you more warm air during the winter time. That's a big miss that we have here in the US in particular. We don't take advantage of solariums or passive heating with our homes. So the greenhouse has many different functions from warming the methane digester, helping us start seedlings, giving us a good spot for some storage that we need before the micro cabins delivered, and just giving us more warmer temps as we're working outdoors. The last stage of the greenhouse is implementing the sleeve, which was really fun and really easy. With the greenhouse being fully set up, we can now move on to the seedlings. Once we have one of our tables set up, we can then start on the potting soil process. We'll first drive over to our urban land lab and pick up some compost from our older compost piles. We only need about one bucket's worth for seedlings, but you can never have too much compost, so we might as well get a few other buckets while we're here. Once we have all the compost we need, we'll then pick up our sifter. Now that we have everything we need, we can head on back and start on the potting soil process. The first thing we'll do is put our sifter over our wagon. Then we'll open up all the buckets and start to pour the compost onto the sifter. We first use a shovel to break up all the big pieces of compost, then we switch to our hands. This gives us more control over the process and it allows us to save any earthworms that may have fallen in from the buckets. Now all the soil that's gone through the sifter is aerated and fluffy. We like to use the seed cells and seed trays from Epic Gardening because they don't use the flimsy plastic but a really sturdy plastic that will last a lifetime. And then we always use botanical interest seeds because they're heirloom and they never come with any duds in them. Now that we have all of our seed cells set up and the methane digester getting the warmth that it needs, our greenhouse is now complete. We then moved the IBC totes so that way we could put the raised beds next to the greenhouse. The only issue was one of them was still full. Kimball wasn't there at this time and it's going to take hours for all the water to come out of the faucet. We had to flip it over to make it fast. Because the water would soon stop draining because the hole being in the middle, we had to flip it one more time, then put blocks underneath it, which was pretty hard. With the IPC tanks being out of the way, we could now start on the raised beds. Even though we're months away from the spring and summer growing season, we've gone ahead and set up our bigger raised beds because it's gonna take some time to fill them up. We're gonna need to be taking logs, leaves, grass clippings, all types of bulk and biomass to cover up the first few feet on these tall raised beds. We get our tall raised beds set up first so we can bulk them up on the bottom, then cover the top half with richer soil, compost, biochar. That way we save money because good quality soil costs a lot of money, takes time to build, and we go ahead and get a jump on the things, logs, and the other biomass on the bottom half decomposing during winter. This is how we fill our raised beds with nutrient-rich material for free. All five layers can be easily collected or created. Today we'll be using some equipment from our Acorn Land Lab as we have yet to build it at our off-grid site. The first material for raised beds are logs. To fill up our biggest epic birdies raised beds, we want as much cheap filler on the bottom as possible. Now when I say cheap, I don't mean anything that's got any type of impurities or toxins in it. We want old rotted wood. The older and the more rotted, the better. So we've got all these stumps and old firewood that's been decomposing outside, bark from a pine tree. We're gonna cut a lot of this down to size and use it as a filler on the base. The wood still has to decompose, so we don't want that near where the plant roots are gonna be, just as a base to prop up the higher quality soil. So you start with the cheapest stuff, lots of wood on the bottom, rotted wood, funky wood. 
The second layer for our raised beds is a mixture between leaves and grass. Using the Ego mower to mow up the last of the summer grass and some of the leaves, take all that biomass to put in the bottom of the raised beds. Important note, make sure you don't use grass clippings that have been treated with pesticides or herbicides. Those types of chemicals can kill your veggie plants and put unwanted toxins in your potential food. The third layer for your raised bed is compost. It's one of the most important layers. This is what it's gonna look like once we've got more compost layered on. It'll continue compressing the leaves and the grass clippings over the next few months leading up to spring. Our fourth layer for the raised beds is biochar. Biochar is charcoal that has been inoculated with microbes. We first make charcoal by placing a small tin drum inside of a bigger tin drum. We fill the inner barrel with biomass, ranging from wood to okra stalks to coffee stirs. We call this biomass the feedstock. We then surround the inner barrel with wood. We then light the outer wood on fire, which superheats the inner barrel. The outer wood turns into ash, but the inside was never touched by open flame. It turns just into charcoal. Once you've got the charcoal that's completely extinguished, you can then crush it up, add it to compost directly so it gets inoculated with microbes and nutrients, or put it in a bath of liquid fertilizer, the type of JDAM fertilizer we brew in our big tanks. The final layer is bone meal, which adds a lot of phosphorus to your raised bed. To make bone meal, we put pig and deer bones into a barrel. We place wood on top of that and light it on fire. Once the bones are brittle, you can crush it up into bone meal. To get started on your raised beds now, go over to Epic Gardening to get your raised beds 5% off by using the code ALL5. You can see the micro cabin on the trailer behind us. These are special trailers. These haulers are made to take prefab sheds, pull them up on a ramp, and then lower them back down on the ramp. They're gonna be using a small vehicle called a mule to move this prefab shed. I didn't know any of these tools existed six months ago. Actually, I didn't know they existed a month ago. We were researching these sheds to see if it would work as a shell for a tiny home. Once we learned how mobile these sheds truly are with the trailer and the mule for positioning, it makes so much sense to use these as a prefab cabin. Cabin is finally here. I say finally, we ordered it two weeks ago, but we're thrilled that it's here because now we can really start moving on all the off-grid systems that plug into this cabin shell. This cabin shell is 200 square feet. The cabin is 10 by 20 feet, and it's about seven to eight feet tall in the front. We haven't measured it yet. And then about six to seven feet tall in the back. It's got a very gradual roof slope to it. We can get away with that in Georgia because we don't have heavy snow load. If you're in a state or a region of the world with heavy snow loads, you need a steeper roof to shed snow more efficiently. Here, we hardly ever see snow, so a gradual grade on the roof is not a big deal. And we wanted one simple roof, just a square for a roof, to allow rainwater catchment to be more simplistic, to have one gutter going along the back. So now, we're gonna actually start moving things around the cabin to get systems in place. We're gonna move the IBC rainwater tanks to the back of the cabin. We're gonna clear these cinder blocks that we didn't need for leveling the cabin up towards the front so we can level our deck. We're gonna move the raised beds to either side of the deck, and then we'll start just getting things organized for 
future systems being implemented. One of the reasons we really like this cabin shed shell design is it has quite a few windows on it. The double doors have windows, there's a window to the left and right of the double doors, and there's a window on the left and right wall of the cabin. We face the cabin towards the south to take advantage of southern sunlight in the wintertime to warm up the cabin building. This is not a true passive building, not yet at least, and it probably won't be fully passive at any point in time because we are leveraging the AC unit or the micro wood stove, but if we can make the building partially passive, it'll reduce the amount of heating we have to do in the building. So we've got it here on the edge of the tree line facing south to take advantage of the southern sunbeams coming in to warm the cabin space. Okay, we've got the raised beds moved into position. We've got the solid capstone pavers for a little bit of foundation where the deck is gonna go. We've got the rainwater IBC tanks moved into the back. So now we're gonna go pick up the deck. This is the deck that we had in front of the canvas tent at my house. So we're repurposing this little wooden deck to go in front of the micro cabin. We've also got the black battery case for the big lithium batteries to power the micro cabin. We've got the table saw that that we're gonna be using for small carpentry projects like the bathhouse, leveling the deck, and other miscellaneous projects to get the off-grid cabin all ship shape. We're gonna plug the table saw into the Delta EcoFlow. The Delta EcoFlow, of course, is being powered by Old Faithful, our 400 watt solar panel, to help us get the build project all going. So we've got a deck now. It's not perfect yet, but it's very functional. We've got a few cinder block steps. We've got the deck eyeball leveled. We'll level it up more with some shims later. But for now, just to be able to, you know, cut pieces of wood on, have a transition into the tiny cabin, this deck works great. The drip edging above me is one of the elements we really liked about this shed design. Some of the cabin shells or sheds don't have a roof line or a drip line that makes it super easy to install gutters for rainwater collection. This shed has a perfect drip line for rainwater catchment. You can see the tin roofing hangs over about two inches and then we've got the drip edging underneath of the tin roofing. Ben and I can install gutters very quickly underneath of that, routing the water down into our food grade IBC tanks for the rainwater collection. We really like the way this was finished out on the inside because the 16 inch on center studs, that's the spec for residential building. Not that the whole micro shell is up to residential codes, it's probably not, but these sheds are built to a higher degree of quality than most portable sheds. So the studs being close together is great. The roof is fairly low, but none of us are super, super tall people. We like how it's gonna be more of a cozy fit but this low slung shed style roof, you know, allows us to put hooks for storage and other types of cool features. All the windows in here give a lot of natural light, which we think is great. After the cabin arrived, we started on our chicken coop and kept it under $50. The first thing you wanna do is look for a hardware store or warehouse. And nine times out of 10, if you ask nicely, they'll give you their leftover wooden pallets for free. There's usually multiple sizes to choose from, and there's usually plenty of them. Now we need to find a tarp for the roof, but it needs to be made out of vinyl so it lasts for years through the weather. And we prefer it to be free. And the answer is right in front of you. It's billboards. Because hundreds of billboard tarps are made every day and they're hard to recycle, billboard companies give them away for free all the time. We can also get other pieces of scrap wood from hardware stores where they're given out for free. We're using leftover post and chicken mesh from a past project, but you can get both of these on Amazon for about $40. First, we're gonna level out the site. We're on a bit of a slope here, so we're gonna use two by fours, some one, uh, um, by four by half inch boards as shims and then cinder blocks to level up our pallet walls. We're basically gonna make a partial cube out of pallets. Then we're gonna work on structural support and then adding the little peaked roof, adding the billboard vinyl, and then adding roosting bars for the chickens. There won't be any perfectly 90 degree angles. There won't be any perfect corners. It's not gonna be perfectly level. There's nothing perfect about this chicken coop, but it's mostly free, and we're not gonna agonize about the details too much because we just need it to be functional, and I think the chickens are gonna like it. So what we've done is we leveled out the two by fours, the shims, and the cinder blocks. We got our walls up, we got a back put on, we got some supports put on the top. Now we need to work on fashioning the roof, which we'll cover in billboard tarp. It's not going to be winning any beauty contests, but we're still trying to make it look as tidy as we can.
We've got the roof stapled on and under pretty well. Now we're going to just use a utility blade to kind of trim things up before we do the last few staples. Now we're gonna tidy up the foundation. Just cut some of the excess wood, get the scrap wood out of the way. I had to contort myself to climb under these roosting bars in the netting, but it's important that we put wood inside the chicken coop between the ground and the bottom of the pallets. Those gaps are perfect for critters to just crawl through. All the netting is pointless if critters can crawl through the bottom. We're building the run, so we wanna see how many feet of run we can get away with with the amount of materials we have left over. We'll take this garden stake and then use the T-post um, hammer and then just temporarily put this in a little bit to make sure that all of the mesh we have left over matches up and can stretch around the run. Today is insulation day. We're making this 200 square foot cabin snug and warm. Winter is coming. Havelock Wool is one of the only sheep's wool insulation providers here in the States. This wool is popular for insulating tiny homes, cabins, RVs, camper vans. It is the most non-toxic insulation you can possibly use and one of the most sustainable types of insulation. So my biggest question is, I guess, when it comes to wool is why wool? Why wool? All right, so for starters, we didn't have to wear protective gear to install this. Every time I've ever seen photos, they're always wearing a full hazmat suit and whatnot. Hazmat suit. Right. Is it toxic when they're spraying it, but afterwards, once it's all ready to go and it's sealed up, it's safe? What do you think? Probably not. There's a term for it, off-gassing. Off-gassing. The more I've read about our health, products and companies and building materials, foods. Nothing is like so toxic, it'll kill you in a day or two. Yeah. But so many of these products that are synthetic kill you just a little bit, month after month after and month. And they all, they all add, add up. up. Exactly, so it's like death by a thousand cuts. Let's say we're done with this shed one day. Let's say we've used it for 30 or 40 years and it's served an amazing purpose, super affordable. The wood on the inside, even the wood on the outside, now I don't know what's in the paint, but this wool is compostable. Mm. This whole thing can go back to the earth. We can grow more grass to feed more sheep and grow more wool. Yeah. That's a circular loop. That is pretty awesome. Can you do that with fiberglass? No. Foam? No. Rock wool? Definitely not. No. So we've got a bat of Havelock wool insulation here. This side on the back seems to be less fluffy and just more of a continuous mat. And then this side here has got all the fluff going on. We've got these 16 inch wide pieces. It's about three feet long, four feet long or so. So we'll begin putting these up and then stapling them in place. The first staple. We staple the top so that the whole bat doesn't slide down or the bat doesn't peel over like a fish mouth. It just helps anchor things. With the online video, we saw that people were using an insulation knife to cut the insulation. So we, we were like, hey, it looks like a steak knife or a bread knife. So we got ours to try to avoid buying an extra tool. It works, but it would take us about three or four minutes to make every single cut. It's gonna take us like three years to get this done. So we're gonna run to Ace Hardware, pick up a pair of shears and an insulation knife because this bad boy belongs in the kitchen and is not rated for cutting sheep's wool. Then do you see any insulation knives? I know. Got more staples. We need those for the insulation. Hopefully these Fisker scissors will do the trick and we've got some more staples as well. And the price is really not that much more. Yeah. It's really not. Like 
fiberglass can cost between 60 cents on the low, low end to, you know, a dollar 50 or more. Okay. The wool can cost a buck 20 to a buck 50 up to 225 for the same square foot. So it's a little bit more expensive, but since we already recommend you downsize to a shelter of this size, you're still going to come out ahead. Like it's going to be more affordable compared to a normal house. Yeah. So go it, small. It'll still be very affordable. And this is what people don't factor in when you're using non-toxic elements. How much are you saving in medical bills two decades down the road? Hmm. No one does that math, and we all should be. Right. It's like, for the food we buy, are we factoring in medical bills? Are we factoring in future chemo treatments? Uh, that sounds grim, but it's true. The shells, the homes we're in, have a huge impact. So, spray foam, off gases, fiberglass, you still need a mask set up. Yeah. You know, what we used here for this cabin, this micro cabin, was about just under $1,000 worth of insulation. For a small home like this, that's really not bad. And especially because my baby boys are going to be playing in this. Right. We want it to be safe. Right. So 200 square feet. It was $1,000 for all four walls and the roof. And the ceiling. Yeah. Yeah. The ceiling. It's not even 11 o'clock and we're over halfway done. All the walls are insulated. Now we just have to insulate the ceiling, which will take a little bit more finesse with a stepladder and then our stapler. And we got lucky because these slabs of insulation are 45 inches across and between the beams on the roof it's 22 inches so basically we just have to cut those in half and then we can just yeah, cut them in half like a thousand times my knuckles are a little bit raw after cutting all that wool since we're putting it into the roof all the stuff is falling into our eyes so now we look pretty snazzy oh yeah well he looks like really smart I probably these are my wife's so I probably just look I don't know a little less manly today The wool's compostable. It's really not that much more expensive. It's actually cheaper than some types of insulation. Every time we create a new man-made synthetic, it's like, oh, it's safe, until they do the studies in 10 years. Oh, it's not. Yeah. And there's a class action lawsuit, and you end up seeing a commercial at you know late night TV. It's like, do you suffer from mesothelioma? Well, you too can get money from this class action lawsuit. Right. I feel like there's a common pattern when people want to use something that's more natural, more organic, even with food. There's, it's always a markup in price. Even with this wool, it's more expensive. Why is it more expensive? It's not used more. Economies of scale make things cheaper. Right, okay. So there's a lack of awareness for sheep's wool. The number of sheep farmed and raised in the U.S. has been declining over the years because as a people, Americans are not too hot on lamb or mutton. Oh, so because I, I, I guess the, the, the biggest purpose of having a sheep is first for its meat. Yeah. And then a secondary, it's the wool. That's right. So if a nation is not big into the meat itself, you're just not going to see much wool because there's not many sheep in the area. Right, not on site. Now, th this, this wool comes from New Zealand. They've got sheep out of their ears. They've got a climate similar to you know England, Ireland, yeah. temperate. Because international shipping is still so cheap, it costs more for the trucks to bring this to us here from Nevada than it costs for that wool to go across the ocean, the Pacific, in a container. Really? Yeah. So ocean-going shipping is dirt cheap compared to trucking. How much did we pay for shipping for this? We paid a little over 500 bucks to ship this from Reno, Nevada to here. And I'll, I'll throw up that shot again where it shows it coming in on our truck. Now, we had picked it up from a semi. a semi. Shipping by water costs a fraction of what shipping by rail is. Shipping by rail is a fraction of what shipping by truck is. We don't have the same cleaning facilities here in the U.S. yet. I would love to see products like this catch on more. Yeah. You know, hemp insulation is promising. Wool insulation is my favorite I've used so far. Yeah. For the tiny house project a while back, we used denim insulation. Denim. It just um, jeans. Recycled blue jeans, basically. Oh, literally recycled jeans. Yeah. That's awesome. Recycled jeans. It only took us, would y'all say collectively, it took the three of us an hour 45 to two hours if you cut out when we went and got coffee and stuff? Yeah, I'd say two to three hours max. Yeah, it's been a blast so far. Hoping other people can see this is possible. Today, we are tackling flooring. We're gonna be using LVP, luxury vinyl plank, on the floor of the micro cabin. LVP is a composite engineered material. Works really well for affordable, waterproof floors. We have young kids. They spill liquids all over the place on a frequent basis. So we like things that are affordable. So LVP checks a number of the boxes off for us. Oh, oh, oh dear. 
All right, we've got the first roll of blue underlayment put down. Now we're gonna start laying the flooring across it and then lay more underlayment as we need it. So for installing LVP, you don't need too much really. You need a mallet. This is, I think it's called a hanger. This is just used for tightening up the LVP and pulling it into position. These are spacers. We don't want the LVP right up against the um, studs. We want a little wiggle room. So the last piece here is too long. We're gonna have to cut it to make sure that this is one continual flow. So we're gonna flip the board over, measure the excess, then take it to the table saw to cut. We've got the Delta EcoFlow all powered up from the solar panel, powering the table saw to make all the cuts on the LVP. So we don't want the seams of the boards all lining up. That'll look weird and it'll just compromise the integrity of the floor. Seam, board across, seam, board across. So we're using the scrap piece from the last cut to begin this next row to offset all the seams on this next row of boards. All right, we're done with the first row of flooring on top of the underlayment. We're gonna roll another section of underlayment. So this LVP we used was left over from our previous project because we're trying to do the project as cost effectively as we can. We need one more box to finish out this um, floor. We looked at Floor and Decor's website where we got this from originally, and you know, a box of LVP was you know, 95 bucks. We're like, okay, let's ship it to the store or ship it to our house. Floor and Decor wants to charge us $300 for shipping. We are not buying that last box we need. So we're gonna go to Floor and Decor looking for new core five millimeter LVP and just try our best to color match it. We found it. We found the 5.5 millimeter coffee oak. It's not the same color as what we've been using, but it's what they have here. You can probably find leftover LVP on Facebook Marketplace, perhaps even flooring installers, Craigslist, to do your own tiny house or cabin project on the cheap. All right, let's see how bad the color mismatch is. Can't even notice it. Barely visible. Very subtle. <laughs> Welcome to the mudroom. We're actually gonna leave the corners unfloored and make a two by four box. It's gonna be an access port so we can drill holes for electrical or water lines to leave the shed. So those will just give us egress and ingress if we're trying to get pipes and cables in and out of the um, shed. We did it, the LVP is in. So we've got the LVP on top of that underlayment. We used LVP we had from a prior project to save money. We ran out of it and had to go buy this chocolate LVP. Honestly, it looks like a design choice. This looks like a Vogue boho interior designer came in and said, let's make the first band coffee oak and then make the rest of the floor blonde oak. It's gonna have this feng shui where people can understand that there are earthier vibes when you're entering the building and it turns lighter and airier as you come in. We're actually just cheap but I'm hoping that's what people think when they enter into our micro cabin. Time to put up the interior walls. So we measured the perimeter of the building. Now it's a 10 by 20 foot shed shell. So we've got 60 feet of perimeter and we're actually using four by eight foot pieces of plywood as the interior cladding. We're avoiding sheetrock because even though sheetrock is cheap, it would crumble potentially and crack when we move this portable cabin from place to place. Plywood will actually increase the structural integrity of this entire micro cabin. So we're going with a really well finished plywood. It's birch. We're using quarter inch plywood for the ceiling, half inch plywood for the walls. We've already picked up all the plywood at Home Depot. So we've got the plywood unloaded. Now we're gonna start taking the final measurements, making the cuts, and then getting the siding, the interior walls up so this little cabin comes together. Looks like we're at 77 inches, which is gonna be perfect. So because the studs are 16 inch on center, the plywood should line up right over it to where there's half a stud for us to screw the plywood onto the stud with.
first panel is in. So we're just keeping it in with four screws that are countersunk in. We're kind of filling this out as we go. We want it to look really clean. We want this to be modular. If we ever need to move a panel, we can easily pop it off and fix something back there, add electrical or plumbing. So we're gonna put the same panel up on the other side. The middle zone is where the wood stove is going with the metal backing. So we're gonna do that one last with scrap plywood because it's covered up by metal. So we'll tackle the mirror panel on the other side, then work on some panels up front just so as we get our bearings with this style. Panel one, meet Woody. Panel two, meet Woody too. We've got to test panels up just to see how they work. We want to work out the kinks on the simple cuts before we do more complex cuts. Let's panel up the rest of this cap. So we got this first set of panels done on the front wall, above and below the window, and then this larger panel. We're pretty happy with how this turned out. The gap in the top panels there is beautiful. Down here, we didn't quite get the gap we're looking for because we didn't have enough room on the stud. So we're gonna copy this on the other side, get that done because we know how to do it now. Then we're gonna work on the more complex pieces in the corners. We're going to tackle everything above the doorway and then tackle the sides of the front wall. And then we're gonna go hunt down Joe and pull him kicking and screaming off of his laptop where he's editing videos so he can help us hold up these ceiling panels. All right, we got the front left and right sides done around the door. We're happy with it. We like the way it looks. This plywood is so light and airy. I don't even know that we're gonna stain it. We're definitely not gonna paint it. It's got that high-end Scandinavian vibe. We're bringing Ikea to a 200 square foot mini cabin. We're now gonna make the measurements for the area above the doorway and get that connected and covered up. We got the two panels above the doorway installed. Now we're gonna do the last two panels in the corners of the front wall, and then the front wall is good to go. Because we don't have a stud in the corner that we can mount the panel on, we're gonna have to cut some three inch chunks of two by four to put up at the top and the bottom to give ourselves a mounting point. So we'll cut those three inch two by four chunks, get those positioned in and attached. Then we'll measure for the panel and do the same on the other side. And then the front wall will be done. We're officially done with the front wall. All the panels are in. They look pretty good. We're pretty happy with it. A little bit of trim here and there will clean things up, but we like our plywood wall. The plywood looks really high end and you don't need sheetrock anchors to anchor anything. This improves the structural integrity of the micro cabin. The micro cabin can be relocated no problem because there's no sheetrock to crumble if it's moved. So we're pretty happy with the result so far. We're gonna keep trucking. Get the back wall done, work on the roof or the ceiling, and then the sides. We just finished the back wall corners. Now we can move on to the ceiling. This is half inch plywood behind me on the walls. This is quarter inch on the ceiling. And for two guys installing it, I think we did pretty good on the first panel. It's getting later in the day, but Ben and I are determined to finish this. So this first panel went up pretty good. We're gonna go get some more on now.
so we're done with the ceiling. All of the quarter inch plywood panels are installed. Now we're gonna finish up the left and right sides of the micro cabin. We're building a rainwater system to get free water for life. And the only rain for the month is coming in just two days. And there's a bit of an issue. We haven't actually built the rainwater system yet. See, our purifier needs pre-cleaned water to work, and our pond water is anything but that. I, I think it's gonna work, Ben. It's been like 30 minutes and uh, the sand, everything is still there. We really need rainwater. So we searched for the most affordable and simple rainwater system. And every search led right to the first flush method. Super affordable, simple, and kind of genius. So before we try and build it before the rain comes, I'll explain how the first flush system operates. So it's raining and your gutters are flowing with water. And you think, I'm gonna capture that. So you take some PVC pipe, an IBC tote, and bam, you're collecting rainwater. And you're collecting leaves and bird poop too. Okay, so I'm sure there's some sort of purifier out there to take care of this, except there's not. Leaves are still gonna gunk it up. And a purifier cannot keep up with the water volume coming off your roof. So a purifier won't cut it. So the first piece of equipment we're gonna wanna get is something called a leaf eater, which is basically a mess over a box and it's gonna capture all your larger debris but unfortunately the bird waste and other small stuff is still getting in wait a second we have clean water flowing out now but we know the leaf eater isn't doing this so what just happened well when you have a roof covered in leaves and other matter it's all gonna come off when enough rainwater has fallen so this means you can really just expect a lot of debris in the first few gallons of rainwater but eventually all the rainwater coming off your roof will be much cleaner so the question is how do we divert the first few gallons of rainwater but then start collecting it once it's more clean well, the answer is the first flush system. Now that we've cleaned up the area, we'll set out all the gutter pieces parallel to the micro cabin and go ahead and put it all together to get an idea of what it should look like once it's actually installed onto the micro cabin. This is the left end cap. We've got a left and a right to keep the rainwater from going off the sides of our gutters. We simply pop this on the end of the gutter, then we crimp it to make sure it doesn't move out of place, and then we caulk it to keep the water from leaking out of the edges. That's all there is to it. This is a five inch gutter seam this is how we connect two segments of 10 foot gutter together. This goes on the outside, both pieces of gutter slide in, and then we use epoxy to tighten it all up and keep it glued so water doesn't leak out. This is the downspout connector. So this downspout connector is at the very end of our gutter setup. The gutters are all gonna be slightly tilted towards this so that all the water is funneled through here. This will then pipe the water down into a flexible pipe which goes to the first flush diverter and then the actual rainwater storage tanks. This is our universal strainer. This is temporary before we put in a better rain guard and leaf guard on top of the gutter. This keeps leaves from clogging up the downspout. These are the clip mounts that pop inside of the gutter. Then there's a screw that anchors the gutter onto the fascia board on the side of the micro cabin. And we're actually gonna be aiming to line these up where there is a rafter on the roof for a deeper anchor. We're gonna measure along the gutter to evenly space these out. We wanna make sure that we've got a clip at the edge of every piece of gutter for the maximum support so that the gutters don't sag on the end. Rather than epoxy the gutter seams on the ground where it would be one 20 foot segment of awkward unwieldy gutter, we're gonna put both 10 foot segments in position and screw them into the fascia board, then come back with the gutter seam with epoxy to have a nice clean fit, let that dry, and then the gutter is mounted. Ben's gonna hold the middle of the first segment of gutter while I mount the first screw into this far corner. That's gonna be the highest point of the gutter. It's gonna be just underneath the drip line. Then we're gonna have a half inch drop, so the gutter drops half an inch towards the middle of the micro cabin to let the water flow towards the downspout. Before we put up the second segment of 10 foot gutter, we're gonna go ahead and epoxy this seam and put that up on the existing gutter panel before sliding the second one into position 
because then we wouldn't have the room to maneuver this into place. Now that we've got both pieces up here, I'm gonna use this epoxy to do a thin bead over the gap. So we're gonna epoxy the last seam under this second segment of 10 foot gutter. Then we're gonna attach the end downspout, epoxy that, screw it in, and we've pretty much got the first step all done. All right, now we're gonna connect the first flush diverter to the gutter system, now that the gutter system is attached to the micro cabin. We do this in three stages. First, we install the gutter system and take all those measurements to make sure the gutter system is properly attached and measured. Then we can take measurements for the pipes that go down on the micro cabin's back to be able to connect to the first flush diverter. And we measure out all those pieces of pipe and get that all set up. The third and final step is measuring the piping we need from the first flush diverter to the actual IBC tanks. There's a lot of measuring that requires first pieces to be installed. That's why we take these measurements and buy these pieces in three stages to make sure we do it properly so the whole system fits together. So before we build it, here's an explanation of how the first flush filter works. Once your leaf eater has caught all the bigger debris, the water with the smaller debris falls into the pipe below, where there's a plastic ball that rises with the water level, eventually hits a ring inside which seals off the bottom pipe, so fresh water now goes out the side. So now the question is, how much rainwater do we need to seal off in the bottom pipe before it becomes clean? Well, let's do a few measurements. If we take the square footage of our roof, which is 10 feet by 20 feet, or 3 meters by 6 meters, it's 200 square feet or 18 square meters. Since rainfall is usually calculated in inches or centimeters, let's convert these numbers. So our roof space is 28,800 square inches or 180,000 square centimeters. And according to various online sites, you need about 0.025 inches or 0.063 centimeters of rainwater to wash off your tin roof. So now if we take the area of our roof and multiply it by the height of water needed, we see that it'll take 700 inches cubed or 10,800 centimeters cubed of water to rinse off our roof. And that's equal to three gallons or 10 liters of water. So now we know we need to at least have three gallons or 10 liters of water in the pipe before the ball seals it up, so we need the exact amount of pipe to hold the 3 gallons or 10 liters of water. We're using 3 inch pipe, and after using an online tool, 3 gallons of water is equal to about 8 feet of 3 inch pipe. 8 feet of vertical pipe won't work, it's going to go into the ground, so we cut it in half to make this L shape. These extra pieces to make the L shape added more volume, so we only need about 6 to 6.5 feet of pipe now. Now that we've got everything laid out for the first flush diverter and the PVC pipes to the tanks, we're going to mount this leaf eater to filter out the leaves on the side of the micro cabin. Now that we've got the leaf eater mounted on the micro cabin, we're gonna cut about a six inch chunk of PVC to connect the leaf eater to our three way PVC joint. We're gonna insert this wire mesh, which will just be a friction fit. This keeps the green ball from going into the horizontal component of the first flush diverter. We don't want that green ball getting trapped. To anchor the pipe securely, it's important that you find a stud underneath of the exterior shell. Simply look for screws or nail heads that are on the outside under the paint. That's where your stud most likely is. The first flush converter needs a drip cap on the end. This way the three gallons of dirty water we sealed up have a way to leak out before the next rain. If it's more than a drip, all the water is going to flow out, making it where you can't seal off the first flush with the plastic ball. Now I'll connect some tubing to send all the water from the gutters to the leaf eater. Now it's time to put our IBC tote into place. The great thing is, you can put as many IBC totes in a row as you want and just connect it with a piece of pipe on the bottom. For our needs, we only need one. We're literally wrapping up the last part of this and the rain is starting to come down. Not a moment too soon to wrap up this project. We'll now measure for the last piece of pipe that runs from the wall of the micro cabin into the IBC toad. Water is always going to find the path of least resistance. Since we have not cemented any of these joints together, we're really trying to make sure there's always a downhill slope. Our theory, at least, is that as long as the slopes are downhill, the water is going to follow that path of least resistance. Whereas if there's an accidental uphill slope, this joint would leak. We're going to find out. Now we're going to put a cover on the IBC tank to prevent unwanted algae growth. If sunlight hits the water, algae will grow in here faster and we want to avoid that. We'll then put a piece of overflow pipe going over the side of the IBC tote with a filter to make sure nothing can crawl up inside of it. Now that it's complete, all the rainwater coming in tomorrow during the big storm can now be used for drinking water as our purifier can handle it compared to the pond water. After wrapping up our rainwater collection system, it was time to move on to the stove, which had finally arrived, and this happened. Uh-oh. 
But before we show the misfortunate event that happened, we're going to show you all the first step that you need to do before installing a wood stove. Before we can unpack the stove that I'm sitting on top of, we've got to put these 1x4s up on the studs to hold the metal tin roof sheeting. The tin roof sheeting is the metal backsplash to help radiate heat and just provide a clean surface behind the actual stove. After we get up the metal backsplash, we're unpacking this thing. Having metal as a backsplash for the tiny wood stove keeps things safer, it helps radiate the heat out more in your shelter, and it just looks cool aesthetically. The floor to ceiling height of the back wall is 77 inches. So we're gonna use these tin snips to cut down the eight foot long tin sheets to 77 inches to start paneling the back. All right, with the first panel cut, we're gonna mount the first tin roofing panel as the backsplash behind where the wood stove's gonna go. We're gonna get that one centered. Then we're gonna cut the other panels down to size, get them up there as well. We're gonna make sure that the middle panel is actually the one that's overlapping the other panels so we can easily pull it off to cut out the area where the wood stove pipe will be leaving the micro cabin. In total, it took Kimball and Ben about an hour and a half to install the backsplash for the micro wood stove. Once they wrapped it up, it was time to move on to installing the stove. Uh-oh. Broken glass. The stove looked like it was packaged really, really well. There's broken glass around the bottom. It looks like this might have been broken during transit. So we're gonna finish unpacking it to see. I mean, something's obviously broken, but hopefully it's a piece we can easily replace. Okay, that's good. We can easily replace this on our end. We just need the glass piece. So we found out one of the metal pieces that was packaged on the inside of the stove must have been pressed up against the glass, and that's what made it break. Then this happened to our backup heater. It happened, we lost it, power's out. It's gonna take us a while to charge back up the battery, um, which means we're out of heat for quite some time. Ooh, it's cold! Four cold days later, good news came. Tiny Wood Stove Team, thank you. They sent a replacement glass panel within four days. So huge shout out to Tiny Wood Stove Team. We're thrilled to have a new glass panel so we can get this build underway. But unfortunately, the biggest issue was yet to come. To make the wooden stand for the stove, we're using this plywood that we had left over from the interior of the cabin. We're gonna cut a top 23 by 23 inches. We're gonna cut sides that are 19.5 inches, cut a base, and then work on assembling that box or stand for the wood stove. We want the box to be very sturdy because the wood stove is not light. It's very heavy, so we need some good supports with plywood struts in the middle of the box to make sure it doesn't sag. We're also gonna top the box with either tiles or tin just to keep embers that might pop out of the front of the stove from burning the top of the box. It'll just improve safety and make the aesthetic look really good as well. Now that the mounting box and the stand for the stove are completed, we're gonna assemble the stove and then put it on top of the box. That's the easy part. Then we've gotta figure out how all the flue pieces work. For the last three hours, the wood stove has been going through its first burn outside. This is an important step as it seals and sets the manufacturing paint. Time to look oh. muscular. Oh. <laughs> With the first burn being done, it's now time to build. So here's a breakdown of how this is going to work. Most people send the flue component straight up through the roof. This is what the tiny stove team recommends, but we didn't want to cause permanent damage to our roof by cutting a hole in it. We thought the wall would be more forgiving. And we ended up being totally wrong. We made this far more complicated than it needed to be. If you ever do this, don't do what we did. Go right through the roof like the tiny wood stove team recommends. You're gonna see just how complicated it got for us. We thought it'd be an easy process. First, we'd make a hole in the wall. We'll have to cut a hole in the tin, push the insulation apart, and finally drill out a hole in the wood. Then we could insert a piece called the thimble, which outlines the inner part of the hole with metal. This ensures that the hot metal pipes never come into contact with the insulation, the wood, or the tin. We then add the T-joint on the outside, which will redirect the smoke upwards towards the chimney, and it'll give us an access point we can unscrew in case we ever need to clean anything out. We'll add in the supports, put on the couplings to seal everything up, then we'll connect the stove pipes to the double insulated pipes, and then we're good to go, or at least we thought. This is an adjustable component in the flue, which helps us adjust this to wherever the hole is. So rather than cutting the hole with this set all the way down or pull all the way up, where it won't give us wiggle room going any higher or any lower, we're gonna try to have it somewhere in the middle so our hole could be adjusted if need be using these flue components. This is an insulated pipe. You can see it's got this insulation material to keep the outside from getting nearly as hot as the single wall uninsulated pipe. So double wall insulated pipe, single wall non-insulated pipe. The thimble is gonna be mounted roughly here. Kimball, can we just trace it? Huh? 
Do we get to trace it with one of these? Yeah. Yeah, we can. <laughs> this is a pretty cool bit. This is for creating different diameter holes in sheet metal. I like it because it looks like the um, front part of the machine of the Underminer. Oh, in the Incredibles? Hugh Incredibles clip. We are the Underminer! I am the Underminer! <laughs> Move the insulation apart because we don't want the insulation poking into any part of the thimble. And we're gonna need to mark the center of this and drill a hole so we know where to cut on the outside. With the hole being cut, we then marked up the thimble and cut it to size. It took some serious finagling work to make this fit, but in the end, it ended up looking really good. But our confidence would soon be shattered. Imagine this piece here, this double-walled insulated pipe, coming out of the thimble in the wall. This piece is the first piece connecting to the adapter, connecting to the stove flue. This then connects to this T. This T connects to this lower clean out port where you can clean out any built up creosote other material inside the flute. This is a stabilizer that supports the entire apparatus attached to the back of the micro cabin. The T is then connected with a double wall clamp onto this longer part of the flue. And then we've got the rain and weather guard at the top that prevents snow and rain from coming in. Finally, we've got this other support to hold this long part of the flue or chimney. When we got to making the supports, we realized there was going to be an issue, and the only way to fix it was to get some additional 2x4 and install it. The support system needs to be anchored into the studs in the wall, but it's too narrow. But by connecting the horizontal 2x4s to the studs, we now had an area thick enough to drill the support beam into. Once we wrapped up our T-joint area, we finally noticed our big issue. All right, we are figuring out the wood stove configuration. Tiny wood stoves have phenomenal kits. We've been thrilled with the performance of all of the flue pipes, the double wall clamps, all the fittings. The issue has been our rainwater catchment gutter. Our rainwater catchment gutter has protruded farther than we anticipated, so it means we need a longer flue pipe running horizontally. That's an issue for wood stoves. The horizontal run should not be longer than the vertical component going straight up after the horizontal run. You need that to make sure that the draft is flowing upwards. There's lower pressure up top with the hot gases running out of the flue to draw smoke out of your home. If smoke and the other gases build up in your home, it can be a fatal accident. It can actually kill you. So getting the draft working properly in a wood stove is critical. Otherwise, it's a massive safety hazard. The 20 inch piece of horizontal run isn't long enough. We're gonna try to use a longer piece of horizontal run and then just test the stove to see how the draft performs. If you can avoid a wall exit mount, do it. There's a reason the tiny wood stove team tells you, try to go through the roof and avoid long horizontal runs. So we ended up having to redo a few things and take out the 20 inch horizontal pipe and replace it with the 40 inch. Now we cleared the gutter system, but it also pushed it inside more, which made the inside look a little wonky. This is it, ladies and gentlemen. The moment has come. We're about to find out if this will draft well. Because of the extra horizontal bit that we have right now, we're not sure. But if this drafts, it means it works and everything was installed well. Now that the chimney was put together, all we had to do was put on the flue stabilizer brackets, connect the inside piping to the stove, and then fire it up. With it up and running, it was now time to see if smoke was coming out of the top to see if this was successful. And to our relief, there it was. We now have free heat for this winter and all the winters to come. If you want to learn more about the affordable and sustainable systems we use, you can now get our first off-grid book ever. It goes over the 50 key steps and systems you need to go off-grid. You can get an ebook, a paperback, a hardback, or an audio version. You ready? Yep. You're like nine feet tall. Can we swap spots? Well, I am taller than you in real life, so this really just sends that home. <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> fine, you can have the tall ground. <laughs> oh, I'm just kidding. I don't, I don't want our viewers thinking I'm that guy. We're, we're installing solar panels today. 
10 years ago, my wife and I tried going off grid in a tiny house and we did not have all the skills, knowledge, and tools we have today. If we had had a killer solar panel system like this, we would have made it in that tiny house, but we didn't have the knowledge, the skills, the contacts, or the tools. So we were smoked out of that hot tiny house during a Georgia summer after five nights. Tell them the best part, my favorite part. That we didn't have air conditioning for five nights in a Georgia summer? No, no, about the fridge. Oh, we used a cooler that was not powered with ice that would melt after like an hour or two for the fridge. It was dismal. <laughs> it was like the walking dead out there because we had all the theory about how to live off grid. We didn't have any of the hands-on experience that we have now. So start small, tackle little steps one at a time and get you some solar panels. Behind me, I've got eight 350 watt solar panels for a total wattage of 2,800 watts of solar power collected and then sent back to the micro cabin for our consumption. Solar panels have come such a long way in the last few decades and the prices have just dropped, 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 which is phenomenal for off-grid living. You could honestly live pretty comfortably in a super small off-grid setup with one or two of these panels. We got a slightly bigger solar kit since we'll be using it for more things outside of the tiny micro cabin. But for one to two people, a three to four thousand dollar kit will work just fine. With all eight of these panels, we can power air conditioning, a small refrigerator, lights, computers, cell phones, even Ben's Xbox. You can typically estimate, at least here in 2023, that for every watt of power, the panel will cost about a dollar. So a 350 watt panel will cost about $350. With my loafers and this sweater, I feel a little bit like an off-grid Mr. Rogers today. I like that. Could that be our vibe? That's off -grid our Off-grid Mr. Rogers? That's our new vibe, off-grid Mr. Rogers. Will you be my off-grid friend? <sighs> Is that what he says? I don't know, but okay. that probably shouldn't be our slogan. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's fair. So these are MC4 connectors. These are the connectors to connect solar panels together. The way I remember that is uh, M for mom. I love my mom. And then C4 is one of my favorite uh, things to use in one of my favorite games, Call of Duty. So when I look at these, I'm like, I love my mom and I like C4 from Call of Duty. MC4. All right, so Joe's connecting that last juncture there. These four are now in line. We're gonna leave this last one unconnected because those need extension cables going to the combiner box. Yes. I just wanna point out, as someone who has never done anything with solar before, this has been extremely simple so far. We're literally just plugging them together. Plug and play. If the rest of the setup is just a streamline, then solar is far less complicated than I thought. So I've got a female connector and a male connector. We're connecting this group of four panels, which total is 1400 watts of power. And 1400 watts of power, that's a lot of power to work with. We've got double that here, 2800 watts. The average US family uses about 30 kilowatts of power per day, give or take. So a kilowatt is a thousand watts. So we've got 2.8 kilowatts of power being gathered here. So during one hour of full sunlight, you can collect 2.8 kilowatts of power. MC4 solar panel connector, and see these little prongs? These lock this in together so they don't pull apart. You don't wanna lose power because you know a fox tripped and disconnected your solar panel system. There are two types of solar panels. Monocrystalline panels, which are very efficient, made from one crystal of silicone. Silicon, silicon, let's say silicon. They don't call it Silicon Valley, do they? No, they don't. Right. <laughs> Monocrystalline panels are more efficient because they're made from one crystal of silicon, but they're more expensive. Polycrystalline panels are made of many crystals of silicon, so they're more affordable. But typically, solar panels are gonna range from a dollar to two dollars per watt of power. So our 400 watt panel over there, it costs about 400 bucks. This is the combiner box. So this box is gonna be positioned near the solar panels outdoors. These two groupings of panels will plug in to these MC4 connectors at the bottom of the combiner box. This awesome giant red switch which looks like something from like Star Wars or some epic movie. This turns on and off the power that goes to the micro cabin. This combiner box takes the power from both groups of solar panels and then combines it into both of these wires. So all the power is being directed into just these two cables. So we've got our positive and negative here. And then we've got these lugs on the end, which will bolt on to the power board where the power is then stored in the batteries and then converted into 120 volt AC power. Because the power from these solar panels is DC, direct current. It's just a steady flow. AC, 120 volt AC is what we're used to in our homes. AC current switches back and forth, back and forth, back and forth in polarity because it helps the power move along the power lines more efficiently. So this is going to be DC power going to the power board. This combiner box takes all the power from the panels, simplifies it, aggregates it, combines it, if you will, into just these two cables. We're going to drill a hole in the floor of the micro cabin, run these up, and then we'll use extension cables to plug the combiner box into these solar panel groupings. All right, Joe, are you ready? 
I, I, I guess we are. I guess we are. I'm gonna run these over to the base of the tiny home, the micro, micro cabin. It's not a tiny home, it's a micro cabin. Whatever we call this. It's a micro cabin. All right, so we'll drill a hole back there in a moment. But for now, let's go ahead and connect up this extension cables. Red is positive, black is negative or neutral, if you will. Gotta match up the colors. All right, click. And then I'm just plugging in the number one position for both the positive and the neutral. Click, click. All right, we'll run these out. Okay. Sometimes the cables can be a little tricky to get together and you need to get like a little needle nose plier just to kind of help jiggle the lead. We need to jiggle it. Yeah, we need to jiggle it. This is just something I've noticed in the manufacturing process. Sometimes that little metal pole down there, that contact can be a little off center. So I just get some needle nose pliers and I'll just gently bend it down a little. Happy little contact there. Happy little contact. Are we the Bob Ross of off-grid now? The Bob Ross meets the Mr. Rogers. I think that's a really great spot for us to be. I'll be Bob Ross. You can be uh, Mr. Rogers. There it is. Click. Okay, that's connected. Now let's let's connect up some happy, some more happy little contacts. Got my extension cables over here. Positive and negative. Positive male connector here. And then the female neutral connector. We'll take this down to the second group of our panels. It is so satisfying snapping all these MC4 connectors together. That grouping of four panels is running into the combiner box. That grouping of four panels is also running into the combiner box. This is the awesome switch. Even though it's not gonna do anything, we can switch it. That means power is now running to those two contacts, those two lugs. Let's go drill a hole in the micro cabin to pull those in and connect them to the power board. We're about to drill a hole into the floor, which is always a little nerve wracking to allow the cables from the combiner box to come inside. So I've got a multi-diameter drill bit here, my underminer bit. We're gonna use that just to size the hole for the cables to come in, and then we'll caulk that up later. We've got all the solar panels set up outside. So technically, now that the cables are run in the micro cabin through the hole, we are collecting solar power. We're just not storing it, and it's not in a form that we can really use right now. So we're getting about 150 volts of solar power, DC, direct current, from the panels. Your home and your appliances typically use AC, 120 volt power. So we need to store this power and convert it to power that we can actually use for our computers, our lights, our fans, our AC unit. That's what all this behind me is for. Continuous Resources made all this plug and play. This is the battery box. These are our two big lithium ion batteries. Both of these batteries generate about 51, 52 volts with a 100 amp hour capacity. So these are the beefy batteries that store all the electricity that's collected from the solar panels. But to do that properly, they need help from the power board. This power board is just a big piece of plywood that's got a black coating on it. All the solar gadgets, if you will, are bolted on and wired together really tidily by continuous resources. That's what they do. Continuous resources make solar panel kits to make solar installs easier for novices like us, whether it's an RV or a big off-grid cabin. The power board has an inverter to convert the 50 volt, roughly 50 volt current from the batteries, that's DC, to 120 volt AC current that's gonna go to the breaker box to then go to our outlets and lights. Beyond the inverter, we've got a charge controller so we don't overcharge the batteries. We've also got DC output if we wanna run 12 volt power. And we've even got a digital monitoring panel, which makes it pretty easy to see how the system's performing. There's even a Wi-Fi option to connect this power board to Wi-Fi so that continuous resources can diagnose and troubleshoot any issues with the power board and the solar panel setup. We know that some folks might not think that that's particularly off-grid, having your solar panel system connected to Wi-Fi, but we think it's pretty cool that continuous resources can monitor any issues and help us better run our system from abroad. The technical definition of off-grid means you're just not relying on public utilities. So if we've got rainwater or well water, if we're using, instead of, you know, mains water, if we're using a small wood stove instead of uh, being connected to a gas line for heating our home, and if we're collecting electricity through solar, then technically we're off grid, even if we send some data back to make sure the system is running properly, which we think is awesome. All right, so without further ado, we need to be connecting these batteries to the power board. We need to be connecting the solar panel output to the power board, and then the power board's gonna be connected up to our breaker box. 
The power board is the center of the magic of the solar panel system. All right, let's start connecting. Now we just scoot the battery box over. Yep. Actually, before we connect the batteries to the bus bars, we're gonna connect these battery cables to the power board. So we are going to start with the positive cable right here, red. All right, let's get this tightened up. We need the batteries connected minus to minus, plus to plus. The batteries are switched to off, so there's no current coming out of the batteries. Orange is going on to positive. We'll put the protective caps back on. This is the six AWG uh, heavier duty wire that's going to take the alternating current from the power board to the breaker box. We've got three wires in there. There's ground, positive, and then neutral. We've got to strip this. Then we've got to strip the wires underneath of it, attach contact lugs, and then use a heat vacuum to put the heat shrink around those lug contacts. So this is not a plug and play part. Um, this is us dipping our toes into basic electrical work, but we're up for the challenge. So when we just have black and white, white's neutral, copper is ground, and this is hot, um, positive. I use some scissors to cut away um, the sheathing. They make plenty of wire strippers, but we're doing such a small job, we're just gonna use what we have. Then I've got these needle nose pliers. We're gonna expose the copper wiring underneath. We're gonna get the heat shrink. We'll take one black, one red. As a novice DIY electrician, not a certified or licensed electrician, I'm not gonna lie, the colors are a little confusing, but uh, the internet's got plenty of great resources, so. We are gonna be putting the red heat shrink on the black and the black heat shrink on the white just because black is hot when white is neutral on this type of wire setup. So then there's the lug. This lug goes on the tip here and then this lug would go here. So we're gonna take this lug and now we're gonna crimp this lug down. This lug might be a little too big for this crimping tool, but we're gonna see how well this works. Yeah, I think it is a little undersized. The point is to stick it on there good and that is, that is on there good. We'll use the heat shrink, we'll get the hair dryer from the Delta EcoFlow. The two minutes of using this hair dryer on high took 10% from that Delta EcoFlow. Neutral, positive. And we're gonna need to put some green tape on there to mark that it's ground. All right, so we're all done with that board right there. Yeah, so the AC power coming out is hooked up. Um, we just need to put a green sticker on the ground wire insulator, and now we can move the battery box into position to test. Right up to that edge. Yeah, right up to it, but not past it ideally. Now that we've got these heavy jumper cables connected to the power board, it's time to run them to the batteries and finish the battery setup. But first, when we got our last shipment of cables from Continuous Resources, we got something that I don't think many solar companies would send you. Matt sent us a list of puns to add to our dad joke repertoire. Joe and I both have young children. May I read the puns? Go for it. All right. What did the sushi say to the bee? Do you know? You do, because you already read it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what did the sushi say to the bee? Wasabi. <laughs> nice. What kind of shoes do frogs wear when camping in the summer? Wait, wait, I think I know this one. Open toed shoes. Open toed shoes. We read these earlier. <laughs> I was just so delighted to find these though. This is the kind of touch you get. Now I'm not guaranteeing that you're gonna get puns with your solar setup like we did. Thank you, Matt. But working with a group that's smaller like Continuous Resources, in my opinion and experience is always hands down better than working with some massive company where you gotta open, you know, five or six support tickets before hearing from somebody and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, final pun. What do you call an angry carrot? A steamed vegetable. All right, so pun's <laughs> red. Let's get these batteries connected. I feel my, my dad level increase. Okay, so these are off. We have no current coming out of the batteries. We need to connect these jumpers from the power board to the actual lithium ion batteries. All right, so this is negative. We'll put the protective cap back on to prevent unnecessary shocks. Now for the positive jumper. These jumpers are very satisfying to work with. Feel very heavy duty. These are securely attached. Now we've got to configure the batteries. Now we're going to connect the communication cable, the ethernet cable between the batteries. This is battery number two down here. So we're going to connect it in the far right port. 
We're gonna connect this in the middle port. Now, we need to connect the longer ethernet cable to the servo communication um, display on the power board. So we'll connect this here to the CAN port. And then I need to pull this little punch out. These punches are pretty cool. You just twist them and then uh, they'll break out for you to run cables through. We'll run this outside of this. And then the servo, it's actually just right here. We'll clean up these cables later. We just wanna test it all and make sure that it's all gonna work smooth first. There we go. So we've got servo, ethernet, batteries are connected, power walls connected. We need to configure the batteries. This battery is number one, so we're gonna switch dip switch one up. This battery down here is number two, so we're gonna switch number two up. I'm gonna use something pointy like the scissors. Make sure none of the other switches are up. This is how the batteries monitor themselves with the servo system. Okie dokie. Let's test the batteries. Let's make sure these boot up. Green is always a good sign. We got the run sign blinking. They're fully charged. This ALM is the alarm. That's a warning label, warning light. Don't have those on, that's good. Let's go ahead and just put the um, cover back on these. It's gonna be a satisfying moment. This cover's got a magnetic click, so this whole thing will just click right on. Nice. Okay, so we can see the batteries in there. It's got a little dust on there, we'll have to dust that off. All right, let's go turn on the um, big switch for the solar panels. Pull the lever, Kronk! Emperor's New Groove, anybody? Anybody? Oh, <laughs> that was rough. <laughs> Look, if I was funny, I'd be on a stage being a comedian like Kevin Hart. I'm not funny though. It's okay. <laughs> we'll stick with our dad jokes. <laughs> Wasabi! <laughs> nice. Let's see, uh, let's just run some tests here on the voltage coming out. This is the servo panel. We've got 200 and roughly 200 watts of power coming in from the photovoltaic panels. Batteries are charged at 100. Now we just need to get the inverter running and test that we've got power coming out of there. All right, so batteries are good. We're gonna flip the switch on the bottom of the inverter panel. The batteries are on, power's coming from the panels. You can see the servo is blinking. We've got a heads up display on the AC power, the wattage coming in from the panels, and those are not properly angled at the sun yet, but we will get them there. Batteries were pre-charged at 100. This is a handy little tool for testing for um, 120 volt AC current. So we're gonna turn this pin on, and if we come test here, red means we're getting AC power. So we've got 120 volt alternating current in this cable here. This is the cable we're gonna connect up to the breaker box and then run um, smaller cables to the various outlets. For the final wiring to the breaker box and to the outlets, we're gonna turn off the panels, turn off the batteries, turn off the inverter, shut the whole system down to be extra safe. With the panels in place, the power board hooked up, the batteries functioning properly, and now the whole system shut down for safety, we're gonna finish wiring up the breaker box. We're running the cable from the power board into the breaker box, drilling through the studs, clamping down the positive and the negative and the ground wires from the cable from the power board. We're drilling through the studs to take wire to both of the outlets and then we're installing the breakers, running the ground wire from the breaker box to the grounding rod. So with the grounding rod connected to the breaker box, the breaker box connected to the power board, and the breaker box connected to the 120 volt outlets. The final step we'll be taking is cutting gaps in our interior siding to expose the outlets and then expose the breaker box so we can access the outlets and breaker box and then we're gonna run the final test to make sure we can power appliances. The grounding wire connected in. We're only gonna make this right side hot. We don't have a jumper yet, so we're not gonna add a jumper. We're just gonna make this right side hot. Positive or hot, neutral, and then uh, ground. That was straightforward. So the wire comes to the top, and then positive goes positive, neutral to neutral, ground to ground. Then you just slide the breakers in and connect up to the outlets, and we're good to go.
white on silver, brass on black, and then that is the grounding one. This is our first outlet ever. We learned how we're gonna improve the next one. We need the box, the outlet box to be further up because right now you can see this faceplate's bending a little bit. We're gonna to have to go back and bring this whole thing out a little bit. The cut we made works. We also learned the finish would look better if we just cut the rectangle out and left the edge if possible. We're gonna try that on the other side. None of our projects are ever perfect. We're living and learning and figuring it out. We'll dress this up with a smaller piece, pull this farther back. So this first run gave us some insight to how, on how to make the second outlet better. Man, I wish we did that on the other one. Okay, the wall panels are cut, the outlets are in. We're gonna run a few more tests to make sure we're getting current. We're gonna test the breakers. Then we're gonna finish propping up the solar panels, getting the grounding rod and the uh, grounding line all installed. This test is kind of dumb because we're gonna use sunlight captured by solar panels, stored in the batteries, to generate 120 AC, 120 volt AC power to make more light. This is how we're testing, the solar's working. Saving light to then generate more light. Our final step is gonna be running the grounding wire out from the breaker box, outside through the ingress-egress port on the micro cabin to the grounding rod that we've got hammered into the ground. So we're going to clip the tip of this off, get this bolted into the grounding bus bar, and then run this out the micro cabin. So we've got the grounding line coming out of the micro cabin. We're driving this grounding rod deep into this red Georgia clay. Then we've got a bolt to bolt on the grounding wire to the grounding rod, just as a safety precaution for any type of surge to follow the path of least resistance back to ground if there's a short anywhere in our electrical system. Often these grounding rods are fully buried we're leaving this one exposed just to show you all how the bolt clips the grounding wire onto the grounding rod outside the micro cabin. We picked up some free pallets just as a temporary racking system for the solar panels. We want to angle the solar panels roughly 30 degrees. Our latitude here in Georgia is about 33 degrees. So roughly 30 degrees is going to give the solar panels maximum sunlight. You want your solar panels to be perpendicular to the sunlight coming in. That way you're able to capture as much solar energy as possible. These panels will live on a roof long term. It's gonna be just a tin roof covered area on the final off-grid micro cabin location. But for now, we're just gonna angle these pallets up about 30 degrees using some two by fours. That way they'll perform better while we're testing the whole solar panel rig setup. The pallet solar panel mounts are not gorgeous. They're not gonna win any beauty contests, but they're functional and they were basically free to test the system out, make sure we got it all figured out before the panels go up on the roof. All right, we finished out the micro cabin. We installed the breaker box. We installed two 120 volt AC outlets for appliances. We ran all the wiring within the walls. We've got metal panels insulating on top of the doors that swing open for the micro cabin. We've got the futon set up in the corner. We've got a pretty little mirror hanging on the wall. We've got three plywood tables. We've got our kitchen table. We've got our little movable dining room table that's set low where you just sit cross-legged to eat at. And then we've got the office or desk table behind me with the laptop on it. We've got three different lamps positioned throughout the micro cabin. We've got our GoSun solar oven stored in here to be able to just pop outside on the deck to cook food with. We've got our 12 volt GoSun cooler, which is basically our refrigerator. That's under the kitchen table. And then we've got these Big Joe, that's actually the brand name. We've got these Big Joe bean bags in the corner, just as a casual, simple way of, you know, kicking back for a minute. 
We've also got two bar stools that we can just move around as needed. One of our plywood tables is in the electrical corner with the breaker box and the solar panel power board from Continuous Resources. We also have a small trash bin we brought in. We've got our wood stove, wood supplies behind the wood stove here. We've got big jugs of water that we can fill up from the rainwater tank. We've run the water line from the IBC rainwater collection tank inside the micro cabin. And we've got a simple little nozzle to be able to dispense water into our water purifier or our bigger water cooler to be able to store more water for washing hands or any other needs you might have. So we do have running water now, even though it's a simple setup here in the micro cabin. We've got a pretty little kettle to be able to brew tea in and one mug. We'll bring in more plates and whatnot over time. We've got the dehumidifier just to keep things a little bit more stable in here when it comes to humidity. We also have more wood logs stored along with fire starter underneath of the stove here. Then we've got the power board with the inverter, the charge controller, running power to our battery box here in our corner. We call this the electrical corner where the desk and office space is. For 2024, our plan is to move all this to the final location, the seven acres on a river, the final off-grid site. This micro cabin project has been a phenomenal exercise and experiment in what's possible with small living, simple systems, circular systems, and sustainable habits and practices. We really hope you enjoyed this series. Thank you so much for sticking with us. From purchasing the cabin shell, to insulating it, laying the flooring, setting up the walls, installing solar, installing the rainwater collection system, figuring out how we're going to get the wood stove installed here, even building our affordable chicken pallet coop. Thank you for being with us on this Acorn Land Lab journey. From Joe, Ben, and myself, we are so thankful for this audience. We hope that this series has blessed you in some way. We hope you've enjoyed it. And we would like to continue putting out a little bit of content here and there where we can, moving into 2024 and beyond. We've had 2023 to really focus and dig deep on this project. We'll be pursuing some other opportunities and projects come 2024, but all of the materials for Acorn Land Labs will continue to be online. We hope that you're able to pull something from it, go build something, and enjoy the outdoors and just the process of creating something on your own. Thank you so much. See you next time.